From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. I'm going to start out with, with something very, very honest, and it's one of the great commonalities of our species, it is this. People die. Whether due to accident, injury, disease, or crime, the unexpected loss of a loved one is one of the most harrowing events in in human experience. It doesn't matter who you are, a prince, a pauper, we love people, and at some point, they or we are gone. And when people are struggling in the wake of these, these terrible, indescribable tragedies, we often find ourselves desperately searching for answers. You know, uh, questions haunt us. Was there something I could have done differently, we might ask? Or out of all of the billions of people in the world, why was my child, my partner, my parent, or my friend the one to pass away? And this intense pain worsens when survivors are left with missing pieces to their stories you know we we always hear about we always hear about legal proceedings maybe for a, a disappearance or a crime or murder that that go on for years or decades after the event and in many ways it's driven by uh, surviving family members or loved ones not because they f- believe this will somehow you know bring someone back it's because the the experience of closure is so much better than the experience of wondering what happened to a child or a spouse or a loved one. But then there's this other chilling situation, which is what do you do when authorities have ruled the death of a loved one accidental, but you feel they got it wrong? I mean, we've We've seen examples of that, and we know at least – we can't speak for every country, but we know that here in the U.S., there is a clear and systemic problem with things being um, – with, with causes of death being misidentified, right, or with uh, some kind of malfunction in the justice system leading to the wrong person being convicted of a crime. The real criminal walks away, and they get caught, you know – uh, four assaults, five murders later. Yeah. We also know there are real problems within institutions where sometimes, and this is certainly not true of all cases, and this is certainly not speaking ill of any individual out there who may be listening or who is working in any of these fields, but sometimes it is more beneficial to have a, let's say, a case be classified one way rather than the other, that will prevent a major investigation from occurring. Because as far as the authorities are concerned, that closes the book on it. They can devote resources uh, elsewhere. And we all know that law enforcement agencies are often quite strapped for resources. And uh, Every agency is. Every agency is. all, All human beings out here are trying to do the best we can with what we have, right? I mean, I think that speaks to most of us, especially you listening, because you're, you're awesome. Whoever you're you all are. overachievers. Yeah. Well, I mean, we it's just the nature of large systems like that. Sometimes you have to, you, you have to at least attempt to make it function at its highest level. And to do that, you have to pick and choose basically what priorities are. And by its very nature, I'm not saying it's inherently callous, but it has to take a little bit more of a clinical approach to these things than would be taken on the family side, which is obviously a much more personal and emotional approach to this idea of closure. So while the book might be closed on a case as far as law enforcement is concerned, that would be far from the case if a family member thinks they got something a little off. Yeah, and all of this is, doesn't change the way those family members or those loved ones feel and what they believe. None of this, none of the realities change the way that experience at that level. 
Right. It, it, it makes we can all think of specific cases where the uh, where in law enforcement, municipal, maybe even on a federal level, said, "Okay, we've figured out what happened. This is what happened," mm-hmm. and the family uh, says, "No, I, this is not a satisfactory explanation." As a matter of fact, in the past, we've covered many examples of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Often with journalists who found something they don't want you to know and then later somehow died. And before we go on, you know, this reminds me, I, I recently rewatched some clips of one of your favorite shows, Matt, The Wire. I believe it is. Hey, that's a, everybody's favorite show. Okay. All <laughs> right. Uh, one of the best shows then, right? Yes. Uh, uh, backstory, Matt introduced me to The Wire. So we would not have Luther if we didn't have The Wire, okay? That's also true. <laughs> so, that's all. I, that's all. We also wouldn't have McCavity in uh, the, oh. uh, the, the latest iteration of Cats, <laughs> uh, which is a thing of, of, of monstrosity and beauty, and, and everyone should experience it for themselves. Just it, putting that out there. Yeah, I saw it too, it, and I think it is the true spiritual successor to The Wire. It's basically <laughs> the last season of The Wire. Stringer is. Bell pirouetting around <laughs> in, yeah. in a, in a, in a uh, weird anthropomorphic CGI cat suit with ripped mm. abs. Yep. Yep. That's what's up. Uh, in in the before the cat season of the wire, you guys will recall there was a there there was a ongoing plot and I think maybe season four slight spoiler alert, you mean with the vacants where there were bodies that were just kind of disappearing mm-hmm. and I think there the the newspaper essentially created a narrative of their own to explain this. Yes, yes. Full spoiler alert now. McNulty is involved. Oh, uh, uh, McNulty. <laughs> and he, Posing bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is creating, essentially, or, or working with this narrative. Right, the idea of creating a f- sort of false narrative to get some more resources put into solving some of these murders, right? Right, right. Now that I think about it, I believe it was season five, uh, McNulty, one of the main characters, full spoiler alert, creates a serial killer, essentially, and does this by working with the press. And he's – they're getting they're, – they're essentially getting more funding through doing this. And one thing that I think struck a lot of people about that, about that move, was that The Wire had always been praised for its realism. And so for something like that to occur in a very grounded show, the implication is that this happens. You know what I mean? Uh, now, of course, critics – didn't universally love that plot line, but it shows us how how common this debate is, this um, idea that there might be some greater pattern to the tragedy that surrounds us. Here are the facts. Unfortunately, there are no shortages of real-life cases, not on the wire, real-life cases, where in parents or Uh, partners of a deceased individual are certain that authorities through either incompetence, indifference, or even corruption have misidentified a cause of death, essentially that they've ruled a homicide an accident. And over recent decades in the U.S., we've seen hundreds of of these stories. Uh, One that still stays with me that I've been doing some outside research on is the uh, the Kendrick Johnson case in Valdosta, Georgia? That's the basketball player, the the high school kid who was who was found dead, rolled up in the rolled mat. up in a gym mat. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And his parents say that you know bullies killed or accidentally killed him, and the authorities argue otherwise. And they say he accidentally killed himself. Yeah. Um, Story for another day. Maybe maybe we'll do a whole podcast series on it one day. But this might surprise some of us in the audience. Also over the recent decades, we've seen one surprising source of controversy for these debates over accident versus homicide. And it comes in the case of drowning, which is an unpleasant way to go, of course. It really is. But – it, I, I do think it's surprising that, you know, when you would think of accidental death versus homicide, you would think of things like maybe uh, firearm-related deaths. Yeah, right? exactly. Well, n- that's not not the case. Um, in this country, there are a lot of fairly large bodies of water and smaller ones too. They're everywhere. Water, it's everywhere. Uh, raging rivers, you know. They, they are. Um, and – People every year die 
whether accidentally or not accidentally in these bodies of water and to a lot of people. According to the CDC, from 2005 to 2014, there were an average of 3,536 fatal unintentional drownings. Um, and those were not related to boating. In no, no. Right. So not like drinking and boating and that kind of thing. Um, and that, that occurs annually within the United States. So every year. That is – that's pretty crazy. It translates to about 10 deaths a day. Mm-hmm. You know, I just have to say I grew up near Lake Lanier, which is a, a fairly large man-made lake here in Georgia. And it it is um, – it would be surprising. Maybe it would be surprising to you. certainly surprising to me. The number of people who would accidentally drown in that lake every year. Oh, sure. And I, I was unaware of it as a kid, but now – when I see statistics about it, it's just – it blows my mind. And to be fair, a lot of those do have – they end up having to do with drinking and swimming or drinking and boating, something like that. Um, and today's case that we're going to get into a little later also in, involves perhaps drinking, mm-hmm. perhaps drug use and being in a body of water. I have a very tangentially related, perhaps fun uh, fact Okay, you. I'll take some which, fun right which, now. Which you probably already know, and you probably already know, Noel. Uh, it's this. Georgia has no natural lakes. They're all man-made. Oh, So that's that's a little palate cleanser. I'm, but okay. We do. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. The rivers. The ingenuity of, of uh, mankind, you know, on full display here in Georgia. <laughs> yeah, but we do have some swamps. <laughs> that's right. We do have some, some swamps. Not the best for swimming, though. No, no, no just for swimmers. Um <laughs> Ross, David Schwimmer, is that the one? He notoriously loves a good swamp. Okay, yes. Swamp Ross used to, I think <laughs> was his name in the pilot. They changed his character a little bit. But, okay, so that palate cleanser just helps us get further into the rabbit hole here because of those drowning deaths. When we look at drowning deaths, an additional 332 people died each year in deaths that were the linear-esque ones, boating-related. Of the people who die... Uh, about one uh, from drowning, about one in five are children fourteen or younger, and that sadly makes brutal sense. Which is yeah. why life vests are the law. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. kids under a certain age are required to wear life vests and lifeguards, even in kiddie pools, for sure. Right? Yeah, and here is something that was surprising to me: eighty percent of drowning victims, according to the CDC, are male. That I that doesn't make sense to me, but let's continue on down here because almost fifty percent of drownings can be attributed in some way or or in to some extent to intoxication of some kind or another. But how do you differentiate between uh, a purposeful drowning and an accidental drowning? That, ah. <laughs> there, there's the rub. It turns out that proving a drowning was purposeful, intentional, a homicide. Proving that is very very difficult. Uh, a lot of evidence can be washed away, and because drowning is tragically common, and because fifty percent of drownings in this country can be attributed to some sort of inebriation, law enforcement is often it's easy to assume it was an accident because the odds against it being a homicide statistically are very high. Yeah, short of there being like a cinder block tied to someone's leg or, or the like or maybe, you know, choking marks around a neck or something like mm-hmm. that or some sign of trauma that someone was thrown or held down or whatever. It could very easily be ruled um, an accidental death. And again, that benefits – again, we're not saying they're doing it on purpose or being lazy, but that absolutely is – Probably a desired outcome for law enforcement to say, okay, close the book on that. Let's move on to the million other cases that we have. I'm just jumping through here, and I know we're going to hit on this, but the concept, if you're thinking in your mind of, okay, we found a drowning victim, but there is blunt force trauma, like there's evidence of blunt force trauma to the head or something. Sure. How how can you fully rule out that that didn't occur or when a fall happened or, you know, mm. there, there it just becomes – it becomes a labyrinth of you, – you have to basically work to say this was a homicide rather you, than you, – Yeah, the order of conclusions or operations, mm-hmm. the sort of – the decision tree yeah. uh, is, does have homi- – when it comes to drowning, uh, the best way to say it is that medical examiners have to rule out every other possible explanation as to why someone ended up 
dead in the water and they have to think of, you know, drug overdoses, right? Maybe maybe a heart attack, maybe a slip and fall and that caused blunt injury to their mm-hmm. head and they were unconscious and couldn't get out of the water. And only after saying it was definitely none of those things are they able to say maybe it was murder. Not yeah. to mention the fact that unless a body is weighted down, which would be clear indication of foul play, it's going to drift some distance. Mm-hmm. So it's harder to tie it to the location where the fall maybe actually happened or say, oh, this is definitely where they hit their head, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it really is kind of a perfect storm of, of being able to declare it an accident. Yeah, depending on in which body of water they mm-hmm. are recovering. And then it gets more complicated because all of that, if, if all of those things somehow happen and a medical examiner is able to say, this indicates that it could only be a murder. If that very rare set of circumstances occurs, then the next step is to prosecute or find, you know, someone who would have done this. And like a lot of violent crime in homicide murders that we know of and that are proven, uh, the the criminal is usually someone familiar with the victim. Uh, it's not just a rando, right? But prosecutors have to prove that. They have to prove a drowning was intentional, which means they have to build a case on circumstantial evidence. They have to be able not just to say, okay, the flow of the river is this, or we know that the lake works this way. They have to also say, uh, you know, uh, these people were fighting. Uh, Tammy and Tamara or whatever were angry at each other. Motive. Yeah, they have to do motive, exactly. Uh, Where there was money. Uh, there were money issues. There was an insurance policy that just got taken out <laughs> 48 yeah. hours before. Uh, or there was trouble with the law. And because of all of these factors, it's very difficult to know how many homicides involving drowning actually exist. And there's not much research on it. Local police statistics, of course, are not always as well documented as people would hope. Um like, consider this. Matt, you gave us the statistics of drowning overall, proven, proven cases of drowning. According to the FBI, in 2017, we just pulled one, one year from their Uniform Crime Report, there were only eight homicides by drowning. And that's out of, what, more than 3,500, 3,500 per year. So they were, out of those, they were only able to prove that eight were homicides – And this bothers people in multiple aspects of law enforcement. There's a diver. That's that's less than the average number of of drownings that occur per day. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's a great way to look at it. So according to people like a diver named Andrea Zafaris, uh, who began assisting homicide investigators with cases involving drowning way back in 1998 – This diver says, we're absolutely missing more than we're catching in homicide drowning cases. A vast majority of drownings are accidental, but many, which can be the result of foul foul play, are overlooked. So they're saying, they're not, they're saying, look, I'm not saying that everybody who drowned was murdered, but I'm saying we are missing stuff. And behind the scenes, everybody knows it because also a lot of, um, a lot of professionals, like it's their career to investigate this stuff, don't receive the training they need. But what if a killer knew that too? Like knew those stats and knew how easily these things can go under the radar and be ruled an accident. Because if you ask me, drowning someone wouldn't necessarily be the first way you might choose to kill somebody. It's, it's, it's a little tenuous, right? Mm-hmm. Like unless certain things are in place, how are you going to know? Uh, if the person actually died or not. Um, it's an interesting question. But what if someone did know and uh, was able to kind of fit this into their plan? Right. What if some of these accidental drownings are in fact murders? And furthermore, what if these murders are related? We'll talk about that right after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. We are entering the realm of what is commonly called the smiley face murder theory, the smiley face murders, uh, the smiley face killer, or slight spoiler alert here, killers. Yeah, this, this theory argues that 
more than 40 cases, I think 45 or so, of fatal drownings between 1997 and at least 2008 were mistakenly labeled accidental when they were, in fact, homicides. And that number, by the way, as we go through this, has the the number of suspected cases of fatal drowning related to this case um, hasn't necessarily grown, but the possible cases identified by some of these guys has risen up into the 300-something range. Right. And this uh, that number comes often from uh, people who later came to the theory and started finding what they felt were commonalities. And some of the original investigators. And some of the original investigators. Here's the, So here's the gist. The These cases of fatal drownings involved young men, college-age dudes, who were found dead in bodies of water across several different Midwestern states in the U.S. over the last decade. And the investigators eventually started using the term serial killer, which a lot of a lot of professionals hate because it feels a little alarmist and hyperbolic. But why smiley face? What, what, did they just pick that one? We all know what a smiley face is. We don't have to overthink that. It's like we all knew what drowning is. Smiley face, two dots, bottom half of a circle. Oh, it looks like a face. Well, in this case, um, the idea of uh, the smiley face became connected to this alleged um, string of murders, cluster of murders, um, when it was uh, announced publicly that police had discovered graffiti um, depicting that uh, that ubiquitous uh, two dots and, and half a circle smiley face near the locations where they believe uh, the killer or potentially killers, dumped bodies in um, at least a dozen of these cases. Also, a phrase, uh, sinsinua, um, was also cited as being found near some of these areas that were being investigated in connection with uh, bodies found floating in water. I I would like to point out here that the smiley faces, Mm -hmm. again, it's only in 13 of these identified 40-something cases, but it, it... changes a lot. You can go online and see pictures of several of the alleged smiley face connected graffitis and they really like one of them looks like a little uh, version of a devil or a demon. They're in varying colors, varying Mm. sizes and styles. Um, It's it's interesting that it's not a single symbol, you know? If it was going to be just a serial killer, you'd think that it would just be a symbol, but perhaps... uh, as we get through here, it'll make more sense of why it would change. Right. We'll we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes as well. The uh, the differing interpretations of what a smiley face might be, or what the import of it is. Let's let's look. Let's step back. Let's look at the proponents, the creators of this theory. To do so, we journey to New York, where we meet. New York Police Department detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte. Now retired. Now retired, both retired and private investigators. In 2008, they announced that they believed one Patrick McNeil, a 24-year-old Fordham accounting major at the time of his death, did not drown accidentally. But, okay, what happened to McNeil? At the time, by the way, Gannon was, uh, Gannon was a working detective. He wasn't retired yet. Correct. So McNeil was hanging out in the east side, the upper east side of New York City. He was having a night of it. He was drinking. It was February 16th, 1997. He's at this place called the Dapper Dog. That's on East 92nd Street there in New York City. And he's hanging out. He's doing his thing. He's having a night of it. He disappears. And then later on April 7th, 1997, his body is discovered. He's discovered near the 69th Street Pier in Brooklyn. He is floating in the water. Yeah. So Gannon at the time is specifically working in missing persons, and he catches the case. This is in the East River, by the way. The case is ruled unintentional or accidental, and this is one of those things that you you know it, it, it's weird a lot of a lot of people in law enforcement or in related jobs tend to to get a case or certain cases that that stay with them that haunt them you know and this was it for Gannon he did not 
agree with the official findings and he spoke with the parents of McNeil and he said, you know what, job aside, I am not giving up this investigation until I find the real story of what happened to your son. And this stays with him throughout his career. When he retires, he enlists Anthony Duarte, who is his old partner, and he says, let's let's do this full time. It's similar to – in a way, if we want to do another uh, fictional comparison, it's similar to uh, Marty and Rust Cole in True Detective right. season one, mm-hmm. right? When they uh, this doesn't really spoil the story, but there, there's a segment where neither of them are working for law enforcement, but there's a case they can't let go, and they become they're working as PIs essentially. Mm-hmm. That's what these guys do in real life, and. Gannon mortgages his house, spends his savings researching this, chasing these cases, and they start linking McNeil's death to other cases that they feel have disturbing things in common. Because it turns out that McNeil is not the only person in this part of the world who went out for a night partying with their friends and was later found dead in the water. Yeah, let's let's jump right back quickly just to talk about how McNeil is a college senior. He is, uh, like a lot of the people we're going to talk about, he's pretty athletic. He's kind of at the top of his game, right? He's a young white male. Um, and that is one of the things that ends up linking a lot of these cases together. Just one of the top-level things. So they noticed that McNeil's death was similar to that of a gentleman named Lawrence Andrews. This guy was 22 years old. It was New Year's Eve in 2006. He was drinking near Grand Central Terminal, and he vanished. And then later, his body was discovered on February 12, 2007, also off the 69th Street Pier, uh, close to where to where um, McNeil was found. Mm-hmm. And Gannon says that he and his partner have studied the water flow of the area and the contours of the land. And he said, look, the similarities between these two cases cannot just be accident. He believed that in both cases, the victims were drugged with uh, GHB. Which is the day rape drug, right? Right, right. Uh, That makes you, you know, insensate, unconscious, unable to fight back or defend yourself. Right? Is it essentially like a sedative or is it more like maybe, you know, what they would call a benzodiazepine, like a Xanax or something where it kind of makes you black out almost where you don't remember what's going on? I do know it, it affects, it does affect memory, I believe. And uh, people have used it as a party drug, but I always learned about it as, it, as I always learned about it as, you know, a drug that creeps give to people to sexually assault. And technically, I believe it is a central nervous system depressant. Anyhow, he says this specific substance has been given to these guys. They were drugged and then they were placed in the water after some amount of time, which will become very important later. And then these two guys learn that four young men had vanished in Minnesota and Wisconsin over a 40-day period in 2003, and that they, like McNeil and like Lawrence Andrews, had a lot of the the similar things that you had just described, Matt. Somebody's out maybe partying with their friends, and then they walk off, perhaps not seeming to be in a state of distress, and then they disappear. The detectives did something— Interesting here, and it goes to a point you made earlier, Noel. They started looking not to where the bodies were physically found, but to where, according to their best guess, the bodies had entered the water, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's where they found the smiley faces. And again, as as established earlier, not they didn't find forty five different smiley face icons for every you know every body. That, that was discovered, they only found uh, 22 or 20-something at the time. Hmm. I, mean, I know we're going to get there, but I, I do want to say that that is a, as we mentioned, a pretty ubiquitous, uh, very low-key graffiti 
everyone knows how to do it. You know, any of your uh, fair weather taggers, that would be a pretty easy go to to just do a circle, two dots, and a, and a half a circle. You know, yeah. And the guy who made the smiley face, uh, work of genius, really. Like, imagine doing something that that important. It's it's three lines. It's one of those things too, where it's like such a parallel thinking type thing, and such a simple thing. I don't. I I I almost guarantee there's no one like credited with the smiley face. I actually I think there might be actually. I think there might be, uh, and it may be just because of uh, just because that's the person who got it on a T-shirt. That was have a nice day, maybe. Right? Yeah, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Harvey Ross Ball. Yep. Interesting. 50 years ago in Worcester, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. uh, an American graphic artist, he's credited as creating the smile. Okay. That's right. I did a – I think I did an episode of maybe Stuff of Genius about that. A lot of people in the U.S. learn about that through the film adaptation of Forrest Gump when the guy is going on his running streak and then – He wipes his face they, with the yeah, mud, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But – that aside, it is a very, 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 very common, dare I say, ubiquitous icon. It's funny, not to get too off topic, but I, you guys know I worked on a show called Happy Face about the Happy Face serial killer. And he was given that moniker because he signed his letters to the press with that very same icon. And when you Google smiley face killer, happy face killer comes up a lot too. So they're often kind of conflated because mm. of the similarities in the, in the, in the monikers. Right. Yeah, that's that's a very important distinction. These are these are, as far as we know, not related. And I, I don't think Gannon or Dorte are arguing that they are, but they are arguing that they found copious evidence suggesting that McNeil, who again is the, sort of the genesis, the origin point for this theory, that McNeil didn't just walk off a few sheets to the wind and then fall in a river and drown. They're saying that. Someone intoxicated him. They drugged him. There was a car seen following him after he left the uh, the bar, the dapper dog. They're also saying he had ligature marks on his neck, charring on his head and torso, and that the way his body was positioned was inconsistent with normal drowning. So someone tortured him, drugged him, tortured him, and then placed him in the water. They said he had been stalked, drugged, abducted, bound, burned, and then killed, and then dumped in the water. Well, and it, you know, the one major thing that makes sense there is that he was missing for a month, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, he dropped off the map, he was somewhere, and then 40 days later, he was found dead. And he, you know, it doesn't seem like he was sitting in the water for 40 days. Exactly, right? It seems like he had been in the water for a relatively short amount of time, right? And we see that that's another commonality they look for in some of these cases is the, um, the, the amount of time, the gap between when a victim was last seen and when their body was discovered. And in some cases, that's that's quite a stretch, you know? They said that, McNeil was murdered by what they called the Smiley Face Gang. See, because they don't believe it's just one person. They believe there is an, a group doing this. That's the only way they think you can explain the um, the regional distribution of the murders. 25 cities across 11 states since 1997, maybe even continuing today, according to them. And... We talked a little bit about the commonalities they link they use to link these cases, but but what are they? Other than, you know, the the method of murder, which would be drugging and drowning. One of the big things they noticed is that these guys were very similar with regards to their demographics. These are young men, a lot of them college age, who disappeared after a night of drinking, specifically going out and drinking, and they did end up dying. They also noticed that these guys are athletic, a lot of them at least. Um, The majority of these cases were young white men who were athletic. 
and uh, this purported symbol of what you could call, I guess, a gang or a cell of potential killers, the smiley faces, um, were drawn on walls around just 22 of the crime scenes in five different states, including Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. We also have the size and shape of the smiley faces varying, um, and the paint used also varying. Um, Some of the faces, for example, might have had horns, which is a popular variation on that. Like you can think of like an emoji, uh, like the kind of wicked, having, you know, like sort of dastardly, fun, mischievous uh, uh, emoji smiley that has sort of like a smirk in the the horns. I I think think of Hot Topic and Gadzook. (laughs) Totally. I I actually remember when I was a kid, a huge Smashing Pumpkins fan, and there was a Smashing Pumpkins t-shirt for um, that melancholy calling the Infinite Sadness album, and it said the world is a vampire, and it had a kind of iconic smiley vampire with fangs and little horns drawn in this exact same style. Yeah, and Gannon, the the investigator there, even he has a quote. I think we mentioned this, but he calls it an evil, happy, smiley man. Right. And just for a second, when you said Ganon, I was thinking of the antagonist in Zelda. This, uh, I know. Me this, too. <laughs> this different Ganon. We're talking about Kevin. <laughs> Ganon turned a new corner and he, he left Hyrule and became a PI. <laughs> Because he's got a lot, he's got a lot of skeletons and cl- he's a tortured antihero. Wait, is this, is this really a Zelda character? Ganon. Ganon. Yeah, he's the main bad guy. That is, I, I, I was did, from from the beginning of the series. F- from the ones that I played, yes. Yeah, Are you talking the like early Nintendo versions or like more like recent ones, like the, the Wind Walkers? And yeah, all that for me, stuff? it was the early Nintendo yeah. versions. Uh, um, but, but but our Ganon in this story is Ganon with G A N N O N spelling. Yes. Got it. And with a Kevin in front of it. And with a Kevin in front of it. Uh, Kevin's the important distinction there. Really quick, another little just uh, uh, palate cleanser. Did you hear they are – it seems like this is such a missed opportunity. They're making a Zelda series. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be on streaming. Took long enough, right? Doesn't it seem like that one is rife? There was a Zelda series, right? I don't think so. There may be a cartoon, but – This will be live action. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, really? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, shit. Seems like one of the few video game adaptations that actually could be really cool. Yes, I do remember watching the Legend of Zelda cartoons. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was remembering that correctly. Matt, you had you had mentioned earlier that idea the the, the idea of the differentiation between the icons, and again, the idea that there's a very common icon. But for now, let's just let's approach it this way: if this theory is true, it is profoundly disturbing. And again, if it's true, there are terrifying implications here. First. There's the possibility of multiple killers working in concert. The reason that is disturbing is because despite what fiction would have you believe, it is incredibly rare for investigators, for anyone, to find a proven case of serial killers operate, cooperating, really. It's um, the, the kind of um, – Mental disfigurement that leads someone to become a serial murderer uh, doesn't really does doesn't really predispose them to group work or group projects. There are some, of course, there are exceptions there. Uh, Lake and Ing would be one famous case. Oh, uh, that one's rough. Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool, uh, which you may remember from our Hand of Death episodes, uh, and our re- he got a recent mention on our Samuel Little episode. So for that to exist, for a group like that to exist, this would be one of the first proven cases. The second terrifying implication, they have a long career. You know what I mean? Almost 23 years. Right. And that's just – that's That ju- we know about. Right. That's just assuming mm-hmm. what Gannon and Darte have found is, is legit. The third is – if you think about it, this is technically organized crime. At that point, because it it denotes a level of organization that serial killers have not been proven to have. Lake and Ng weren't doing this. Lucas and Tool certainly were not. In fact, uh, Gannon has described this as a a nationwide group that functions in in terms of cells, similar to a terrorist group. The Weird thing about that is, it is possible for it, it is possible for people to operate in a decentralized way like this just by using internet forums to communicate. Similar to uh, the 
What was the thing with Old Dutch, the uh, Lake City Quiet Pills? Yeah. Similar to that. You know, it's it's very easy to start a group and if you're careful with your language to communicate things from point A to point B without ever pinging law enforcement. You know what I mean? Or anyone else. Or anyone else that you don't want them to know. You could do it right under the nose of somebody. I mean, have you ever gone to a forum and, <laughs> and found some stuff that uh, seemed like it was a code? I don't know. No. Okay. All right. Well, I, I don't want to put you in a bad spot there. Or a Facebook group. Right, right, right. But let's say it's all true. If this is all true, then that means those implications are necessarily true. It, it logically follows. And then the next question is, why aren't the authorities doing more? Well, that's because it's a controversial theory and not everyone agrees on what's happening here. We'll dive into the problems with the narrative after a word from our sponsors. We're back. So as we've said, there are problems with this narrative. Uh, this Exploring these problems, of course, should in no way be interpreted as disrespectful to the families or the victims or the investigators involved. We're just looking at all the different explorations. There's a nonprofit group called the Center for Homicide Research, and they attempted to scientifically debunk the smiley face murders or killers theory, they they came up with they came up with a they had a report that you can find online that has a laundry list of reasons why they think this narrative described by Gannon doesn't hold water. And honestly, they they have some good points. Like we do not have solid evidence that the smiley faces were drawn at the same time the bodies were put in the water, right? That makes sense. They also know that graffiti exists everywhere. Especially, I mean, if you think about a place that isn't visited a whole bunch, even if it's down by a, a river or somewhere, you know, you will find graffiti. Well, that's it, where your run-of-the-mill novice tagger is going to cut their teeth is out of like, you know, the public eye, like under a bridge or on a retaining wall, like around mm -hmm. or like the L.A. River, for example, or any other body of water that's in a, in a municipal type area, you know, like yeah. up here, like uh, in New York City where several of these cases took place. Well, and they also make the exact same point that we were just talking about, how ubiquitous smiley faces just are as a symbol. And what a dashed off thing uh, a, a kid might do, you know, oh, I want to be a graffiti artist, you know, what's the first thing that's going to come to mind? The most simple iconographic thing you could do is that circle two dots and a half moon, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, it takes very little forethought, the easiest thing in the world just to dash off from the top of your head, you know? Yeah. And it also pretty clearly doesn't seem to be a, you know, a, a gang sign that because it's not matching, right? They're so right. dissimilar. But they also noticed that that other word that we mentioned earlier. Sin Sinawa. Sin Sinawa. They they note that that is a common use of graffiti, a common thing to be written. Mm -hmm. So it appears to be also a red herring. They're saying both the smiley face and that are red herring. Ben made the point that you know how a lot of uh, you'll see single words written on overpass bridges, et cetera. That is typically a, uh, a signature of a particular tagger or graffiti artist. So since yeah. Sinawa could be – one individual who travels around, maybe a train kid or something mm -hmm. who travels around and just does this tag. Or it could or it could be multiple people who think that's a cool name. Super creepy sounding, right? You know, because uh, graph heads and, and, and painters, they get – they take that name stuff very seriously. Absolutely. You know, uh, it also – it also reminds me of one of my favorite taggers uh, over the years in Atlanta. There was for a time – a guy or girl or person who did the tag Goat Ravisher, and they didn't do it <laughs> in a stylistic way. It, they did a really bad job, so bad that you would think it's on purpose. They, it just looked like they had found something and in shaky block letters spray-painted the Goat Ravisher, and they were all over little five points. Uh, they had they had some spots on the bridge right outside of our office, and I kept thinking, man, I love – I love this 
in my head, there's always some weird college dude. I'm like, I love this dude's energy because it was n- n- real. It was right next to really, really nice ornate tags and pieces. And this guy would come by and be like, oh, and that probably took them like six hours. Anyway, the goat ravisher strikes again. I also like, you know, I also love the idea that this person is clearly romancing the goat. You know, it's really like, you know, whining and dining the goat. I'm pretty sure it's like greatest of all time. I think it's pretty good. So oh. It's know. the greatest of all time, Ravisher. Got it. <laughs> so, Goat Ravisher, if you're listening, nice work, man. Miss we you on the you. streets. Yeah, we see you. We see you. Uh, but Sinisua is a um, – or Sin Sinisua. That's S-I-N-S-I-N-I-W-A. Is also uh, common graffiti. So this nonprofit, Center for Homicide Research, dismisses that as a red herring. A lot of people – I've never seen it. A lot of people who are – yeah, it's not common here in Atlanta, right? A lot of people who are proponents of the theory feel like – this list is uh, somewhat dismissive. But they raise another great point, which is estimating where the body might have entered the water, if it's, you know, X number of yards up or even a mile uh, up river from where the body was discovered. It's just that. It's an estimation. It can be it can be an estimation with a high degree of sophistication, but it's still – it's never going to be a definite or it's it's going to be rare for it to be a definite. There will always be that question. They also disagree with Gannon's findings on McNeil. They say there's no evidence of victim trauma and the vast majority of recovered remains don't show that the victims were recipients of trauma, that they didn't have some you know egregious signs of a beating or something. They also point out that homicidal drowning – is incredibly rare. Again, this this is a this is a statement you could you could pick a bone with. You could have a problem with this one because they're saying that homicidal drownings account for two tenths of one percent of all U.S. killings, 0.2 percent. However, that number has to be based on the very rare proven cases of homicide by drowning. And to be a proven case of homicide by drowning, remember that entire checklist of things that investigators have to go through first. So odds are, I mean, there's no question about it. Odds are more people have died by homicidal drowning than the official numbers would suggest. Can we double back really quickly to Gannon's obsession and where you think this – what the, 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 the seeds of this were? It was that one particular case. Yeah, yeah the that's family. Cool. That's it, right? The family of that yeah. case. I mean, think about that. Think, just think about that. Somebody comes to you and, you know, you're working, let's say, with them for some reason and in, 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 in some ways working for them um, as a public servant, as a part of the NYPD trying to find their son. It's because it's a – remember, it's a missing persons case for him in the beginning. So he's learning everything he possibly can. I'm just I'm, – this is me projecting onto Kevin Gannon. But he's – He's so invested in that family and in this person that he's trying to locate for days and days and days and then all of a sudden shows up dead and drowned. Mm. And I mean you can imagine the effect that that would have on you if the family is like pleading with you to to figure out what happened. You absolutely can and this is why I could never do that job. But does this not seem like a classic example of someone getting a little too close to – what they're investigating. You think he got lost in the case. And got lost in the case and got lost in the emotion of it all and and needed to build another Mm -hmm. narrative and maybe was looking for things that weren't necessarily there. Because when you see this list all gathered together like this, it really does seem like he was making quite the leap uh, of judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's Mm -hmm. the question. So there's more – I'm going to say we're going to bring up later. There's there's one or two major things that make me lean a little closer to – thinking there's something going on. But let's, yeah. let's continue on this list All of why right. it's probably not, at least according to this one right. source. Well, the, the idea that water washes away all evidence is somewhat of a myth or misleading. Uh, they argue that the drownings do not fit a serial killer motive. I do also want to point out uh, that I – this might be a hot take, but I don't think Harvey Ross Ball, the inventor of the smiley face, is directly related you know, I think his hands are clean in this one. Pretty sure. Uh, yes. Uh, and then they also have confessions of uh, confessions of people who are incarcerated that are saying something was a murder, right? Or saying that saying that they saw 
something, they witness something leading up to one of these disappearances. The problem with that is that it's you have to be really skeptical when you hear the confessions of inmates, right? The the again the Lucas conundrum, right? With Henry Lee Lucas confessing to hundreds of murders he could not have possibly done, not have physically accomplished, in exchange for you know perks in life behind bars. It even goes back to the Samuel Little case. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Which is the whole reason we found out about America's most prolific serial killer. So they also say that. In their opinion, the general environment of the disappearances sound like they're more related to accidental or unintentional drownings. They occurred at night. They were in areas not far from bars or college towns. And they said that, you know, people who have been drinking who stagger away from bars are more likely to walk or stagger downhill because it's easier. I get that, but that's like this is not an open sandbox game. When when you're walking home from a, anywhere, you have a specific direction. And if it's uphill, you still have to go uphill. I don't think anybody is like, oh, my apartment's at the top of that hill, so I guess I'm going the other way. Yeah. And then they also say that, you know, rivers also are downhill uh, and they're only a few blocks away from the, the bars where these cases occur and that there's – there, there's a dearth of barriers. There aren't very many fences or railings. So intoxicated people who are having a tough time coordinating their ambulation might just slip and fall. That is a really fancy way of saying walking. I love that. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, mean, I just said walking so many times. That's so. fair. No, that's great. You're, you're a wordsmith. It just stinks because they're saying, look, drunk people, when they're super, super drunk – are just going to stumble away from that bar and maybe fall down the hill, land in a river because there's no barrier there. Oh, yeah. No, like, and, I love that point about it being downhill because that's just gravity is going to, like, take its course. You yes, know what I mean? But these people were missing for a period of time from a week to, uh, you know, a month and yeah. a quarter or something. It's like mm, – and it, I take issue with it, but it's okay. Let's, it feels a little victim blamey, right? Yeah. No, no. That's I yeah. see. I see your point there. I see your point there, Matt. I I agree. And they also say, you know, saying that only males are drowning in these cases doesn't necessarily mean a serial killer is involved, which is true. Uh, they also say that in Wisconsin, particularly the town of La Crosse, foot patrols and police have stopped over fifty plus. Drunk people walking, essentially, and they've stopped them because they were about to walk into the area where the river is late at night, and there are no barriers; yeah. they could slip and fall, or into traffic. I mean, who, you know, who knows? There's any right. number of things, but again, not no victim blaming here at all. I, I do want to point out too that um, I, I maybe got this a little wrong early on when I was leaning on the idea of uh, killing someone by drowning them is not really a sure thing, right? Like if you're just pushing someone into a river, like how do you know they're not just gonna? swim away or, right. like, you know, get out. But uh, part of this theory is the idea that they were drugged and potentially killed in advance of being thrown into the river. That's that's part of it. Or, you right. know what I mean? Yes. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. And that point is one of the things that bugs me. And so – but there's no evidence of that, though. Right. There's some there's some weird stuff going on. We're going to talk about it. There's some weird stuff. I, I want to hit this. They also report on the actions of law enforcement in the same town – saying that they've they've documented the circumstances of at least 20 different people who would have drowned but have survived. And they said, you know, in in every case, we tried to figure out what got them to that point where they almost drowned. Most of the time, uh, these would be accidents. Sometimes they were dares because uh, college kids, right? We were all, we were all there before. Uh, or they were attempting to commit suicide. Or they were, again, this is the most victim blamey thing. They were involved in aspects of auto assassination. This is a first for me on this term, but it, I get it. It's Dar it's Darwin's uh what is it? The Darwin Award? That's what it, that's what auto assassination yeah. is. A Darwin Award. Yeah. Doing something so stupid or like, you know, reckless. That's what they're saying. Well, it's also just a lifestyle that uh, involves utter disregard for one's own longevity or or personal well-being sure. or safety, right? Yeah. Like you just throw all caution to the wind and you clearly are not looking out for yourself. 
People who weren't uh, searching for a victim blamey euphemism would have just said self-destructive. There you go. And I, I think sometimes, you know, as the guy who just said ambulation a few minutes ago, we have to be careful, especially in law enforcement reports or government reports, when you start to see the jargon words, you know, uh, when you when you start to hear, I, I don't, it's like it's the reason that successful cults always go into acronyms. Have you guys ever read by, behind the scenes, like actual leaked Scientology documents, they're riddled with acronyms. They're they're like military writing from the 1950s. Yeah, I've I've watched all of George Carlin's specials, and in every one of them, he's always got a great section on euphemisms and how we like whitewash everything. Mm-hmm. Ac- yeah, you're right. It, it is it is a clinical way of referring to something that potentially is a little darker, mm-hmm. or it's a way of maybe normalizing uh, concepts that are a little more outlandish or a little more uh, troubling sure. by giving them a nice pithy, you know, like unsub, for example. That's the unidentified subject in a murder investigation. When you say unsub, it it, it sounds a lot more um, digestible, maybe, you know? Sure, yeah. Or a uh, conspiracy theorist. That way you can ignore what uh, kind of drug money an international bank is moving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, whoa. The old thought terminating cliche. Exactly. But these points, they also say, as I think we mentioned earlier, that presence of GHB in a victim's body does not indicate whether they were maliciously drugged or whether they did it themselves. That's true if we're exercising skepticism. Uh, but they also say we don't have – enough evidence to say that they were drugged by offenders prior to their abduction. These points have some validity, but let's just – let's talk about – let's talk about the other side because there, there are several things here that are incredibly I, – I don't want to say they're deal breakers, but they're, they're problematic for anyone who thinks that Gannon is completely just reading tea leaves. And the first one is – the one I keep coming back to is the – the length of time, like you said, Matt, the length of time between when they were last seen and when they were discovered. We didn't have great statistics that we could dig up. Love to read them if you if you were listening, you can find them. We didn't have great statistics on how long on average it takes to find the victim of a uh, – the corpse of a drowning victim, right? Yeah. Well, here's the deal for me. I'm just going to lay it out really quickly. Um, in the Rolling Stones article on this subject – that I think it came out in September of last year. Yeah, September 13th. Yeah, exactly. It um it it names several victims in particular. We we talked about Patrick Neal. If you go to this person, uh William Hurley, that I don't think we actually mentioned on air here. Uh he was a guy who was hanging out at a Boston Bruins game in 2009, October 8th, 2009. And his cell phone battery was really low. He's um, He calls his girlfriend drunkenly. He's very intoxicated and says, hey, come pick me up. She goes out to meet him and he's gone. He's not there. She can't get in touch with him. Mm-hmm. Six days later, his body is found in the Charles River and his cell phone is smashed uh, nearby. They, they recover that. Um, like, okay, so that's one, right? That's one – instance here. We talked about McNeil, uh, Dakota James. Yes, Dakota James. So Dakota James is interesting in this, in that if we link him to the smiley face theory, he's a case where something almost went wrong, where something did go wrong for the criminals because on December 15th, 2016, he called his friend Shelly He said he was terrified. He was wandering around Pittsburgh. He was cold. He was – he didn't know where he was. He asked the – he couldn't remember what happened. He just sort of came to and he was walking around the area and the police wouldn't help him. So his friend freaks out. Did he get mugged? Was he in an accident? Where are you? I'll come find you. And then she actually does find him. Uh, and he's not where he said he would be. Her, f- She was able to use her phone to find him. Uh, and then when she got there, she saw a dark SUV in the wrong lane facing the wrong direction. He was walking out of the hotel headed toward the SUV, and she caught him. She yelled at him, hey, I'm over here. And he goes to his car. He got in, goes to her car, got in with her and left. Uh, he didn't seem drunk. He didn't seem drugged. Uh, he was emotional. 
uh, but he wasn't, you know, wet, dirty, hadn't been beaten. He said he just became aware he was walking on the street, had no idea where he was or how he got there. And the last thing he remembered was leaving his work Christmas party and then going to an after party with some of his coworkers around 7, 15 p.m. And the rest of it, he didn't remember. He was traumatized, didn't want to go to the hospital. He just went home. And then uh, the next day, he said, you know, I must have just had a crazy hangover, living wild. Uh, and they may have just forgotten it, just one friend helping out another, except that five weeks later, he vanished after after a similar night out with some coworkers, and his body was found 40 days later, going back to your point. So so this sounds like well, someone almost got him. Yeah, exactly. So he almost – he knew this person or he encountered this person early on, it feels like. But the craziest thing, at least according to Kevin Gannon, Anthony Duarte, and Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice professor, mm. uh, his body, when it was recovered – only showed decomposition for two and a half days, and he was gone for forty days. Okay, so like that's a weird one. But maybe that's why isn't that just an outlier? Maybe sure. Maybe that's a weird one. Okay, that's a weird one. How about Todd Geeb? G E I B. He was missing for twenty one days, and according to these three guys, he showed decomposition of two and a half days. But I still don't see the connection. They're 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 trying to hang like hundreds of murders on this theory, and there's maybe two or three outliers that like are suspicious. And we know that people dispose of bodies and uh, bodies of water all the time. I mean, it's the oldest trick in the book. But they haven't. They have. They've said they believe there could be hundreds of uh, yeah. related murders, but they admit they can't prove it. Exactly. At least for that. And I, I see the point, yeah, because for one thing to be – for one case to be a case of murder, we have to realize one case or two cases, isolated cases, could be cases of murder without inherently tying this all in together. For law enforcement overall, people are still pretty skeptical about this. You know, at this point, honestly, the majority of LEOs – don't think the theory has a lot of sand. The police department in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is one of – is in their theory, it's one of the like primary sites for this. They were in charge of eight of the investigations. They released a statement reiterating their initial conclusion that the deaths were accidental or non-intentional drownings of inebriated young men. And they said that they had found no smiley face symbols in connection with their cases. And so – we see other agencies saying that the FBI released a statement in 20, 2008 denying any any sort of killer or uh, group of killers. Then multiple sources who disagree with Gannon and Darte's theories say that we are creating a pattern where none exists, perhaps as an emotional reaction to the um, indescribable pain of unexpectedly losing a loved one. At this point, Gannon and Darte still stand by their findings and their research. They insist the case are linked. They think the smiley face killer or killers is or are still at large. And I'm with you guys. There, there are specific cases where the official explanation leaves something to be desired. Yeah. Uh, you know, we didn't even get into things that Gannon believes in, uh, about the lividity, lividity mm -hmm. of some of these victims. And that that's a term that's describing the pooling of blood in a, a dead body, uh, like after death has occurred within a body. And, and you know, I mean, I get the, this exactly right, but around 60 hours after death, lividity occurs where blood pools, it just goes to, it uses gravity and heads towards the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's discoloration on the body where the blood has pooled. And he, at least, you know, this team, Gannon and, and then the rest, they're saying that the lividity within these dead bodies is not matching up. And it appears that they were killed on land and then dumped in the water. Mm -hmm. So, and, and here's, here's the deal for me. Even if these cases aren't linked and it's not a single killer or a single group or something killing these people, there are individual cases out there that appear to have enough um, questionable things about them that Gannon and, and those guys have identified that some of these cases maybe should be expanded upon 
or could be expanded upon. That's that's yeah. where I'm sitting with it currently. I see what you're saying, absolutely. And we have an abundance of other theories. This this is pretty much an intro episode to the concept, right? Sure. Because we can deep dive into other theories uh, such as the once popular belief that the killer or killers was uh, traveling via their their work, right? And they were able to use that as a cover because, of course, as as we all know, if you want to successfully get away with uh, committing crimes against strangers, or if you want to if you want to murder someone and be a ghost and never be connected to it. Uh, one very efficient way to cover your tracks is to already have been traveling for work. Oh, which reminds me, we're going to L.A. soon, aren't we? Yeah, I don't know if you guys, if I told you guys this, but I actually have a jury summons on the Monday of that week mm-hmm. that I'm supposed to be traveling. Mm-hmm. I'm going on Thursday, so really hoping that I can either plead, uh, reason with the judge that there's I'm taking my kid to this uh, as a big part of her birthday gift, and I have to like make my case to the judge. But also, worst case, maybe I'll just be. I've got Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to uh, do my. Uh, public service. So hopefully that'll be enough. I don't Just think... Just tell uh, them you believe in jury nullification done. and that more people should be aware of it. Do you know what jury n- nullification <laughs> is? I do. And I saw that on a message board, but I also saw a response to that saying, and then be ready to uh, be taken away by the bailiff for uh, being contempt. in contempt of court. <laughs> Just say it in a polite way. Yeah. Don't, I mean, don't be, don't be one of those, am I being detained, bro? People, that never goes well. Just like – and also – You saying if, go quietly when the bailiff takes me away? <laughs> no, no. I'm saying if you pose something in a respectful manner, then just going to say, all right, this is not the guy for this case. Uh, also, I, I'm pretty sure – I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure you can say, you know, I have work stuff that won't allow me to do this and they'll just summon you for something else. But now we are at – now we are at the end of the intro to – the smiley face murders. As you can probably tell, and you may be on the same page with us, fellow listener, uh, we're not we're not a hundred percent one way or the other. I will say that there are there are some compelling arguments that individual or isolated cases did not uh, did not get their full story told. Uh, but also, I can completely understand the people who would say. Look, because we don't know the age of these smiley faces, because we don't have a good definition of what counts as quote-unquote nearby, there's just not enough of a hook to hang this belief on. But – Take the smiley face away. What if the smiley face wasn't a part of it? Right. What if that was, it was just – just these drownings of young yeah. white college-age males mm-hmm. um, with some of these weird things going on. And mm-hmm. possible drugging and mi- being missing. Would you think there could be any connection there? Yeah. Because right. for me, I I would believe it more if you took the smiley face symbol out. It feels a little PR-esque, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's an excellent point. And we want to know what you think. Uh, we want to hear your stories. There are, of course, as we said, uh, it, a multitude of individual cases. Which ones stick out for you? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. We especially like to recommend our Facebook community page, Here's Where It Gets Crazy. And while we're on the subject of Here's Where It Gets Crazy, this is interesting. Jay Black, about an hour before we recorded this episode, Jay, you went on to Here's Where It Gets Crazy and said, episode request, the smiley face killer's urban legend. The guys have referenced it a few times but never dug into it. It would be great to hear their take on it. Additionally, someone else emailed us yesterday, uh, last evening, asking the same question. So are we group minding here? I'm pretty sure. I saw that too. Because we decided to do this a while ago. So We also had an email come through, I think yesterday, as we were recording this, asking us to cover QAnon. Yeah. Whoa. And that, we just got out of the studio doing that one. Is somebody reading our internal documents? <laughs> oh, you mean our minds, man? Yeah, that's, well, those are our That's what I refer most to internal. my mind. I call it my internal document. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you don't want to do any of that stuff. 
You can give us a phone call. We are 1-833-STD-WYTK. You can call that number, leave us a message. I will hear it. We've been getting lots of fantastic ones lately. Um, I need to do a better job of sharing that out to you guys. I apologize to uh, all three of you. Um, but we, oh, and you, I apologize to you. I'm not getting them out to you either. But some of them don't want to be got out to you, you listener. Um, but that's okay. Leave, leave your messages. We'll do with them whatever you ask. Okay, and... If you don't want to do any of that stuff, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.